Right, thank you, Bhavani. Uh, I'm Anand Ayer. So the audience is still coming in, yeah? It's always a challenge post-lunch, ne? I thought post-lunch will be, there'll be a certain ease of doing business, yeah? <laughs> Seems to be an ease of getting into business first, yeah? All right, I'll just jump straight in. For me, it's a kind of a, a very easy job. First of all is the, the you, you people are relaxed in the audience, but I got a stellar cast here. And it's an ideal team because uh, we have Rupa who's with a bank and looking at lending financing. We got uh, Shubra here who works on both sides, who works with the entrepreneurs as well as tries to uh, on the financing side. And then we got Manas who works with a lot of entrepreneurs. So we got all three perspectives here. Just to set the ball rolling and set context for this session, I know that we've been dealing with WASH uh, through the morning. but. For someone like me who's, uh, who's grown up in a certain India, the last 10, 15 years have been remarkable in the way at least the central government has put down very clearly cleanliness hygiene as its foremost targets. So with the Swaj Bharat mission and the Amrut mission, we have seen absolutely clear commitments towards something like 100% uh, defecation free and then now going to plus plus, so you know what's happening with the waste. 100% scientific management of um, solid waste. 100% coverage for water supply. I mean, these are very ambitious targets, but they've also put their money where their mouth is. Now, I don't need to talk about what percentage of urban and rural because we should be dealing with all of that. It's a huge, uh, it's a huge opportunity in there. Now, there's about few lakh sanitation workers, five and a half lakh. There's about 20 crore citizens who are active on the Swachita app two crore complaints addressed. So means there is a vibrancy that's there. The Swatch Sarvekshan is a ranking that kind of makes cities aspire towards better and better systems in WASH. But here's where the cookie crumbles and here's where I'll come into the panel. 3,000 ODF cities will become 950 ODF plus, will become even lesser. 470 cities have credit ratings. 164 have investable ratings, 36 will have A- minus or better ratings. So you see what is happening is some great intentions and we are talking about few lakh crores put in, committed by the center. By the time it comes to the state and the cities where the action actually is, the best of policy, the best of intention has to meet the rubber hits the road. So here's where I'll tune in and the way I would uh, look at it is uh, start off with each of the speakers tell us is this picture of a great policy space translating to challenges on the ground how do you in your own fields in your own efforts how do you see this landscape so uh, could i ask rupa to go in first saying how do you see this hello yeah great uh, yeah uh, very well put um, actually so um, I don't think the sector is entirely ready uh, as of now, but it's a huge opportunity as we see it. Um, uh, it's poised for immense growth. I read a report uh, by Niti Ayog which says that in the next five to seven years, the demand for supply, a uh, demand for water will, will be double uh, than that of availability of water causing huge scarcity in, in India, I'm talking about inside India, both uh, with public and industrial usage. Um, it will also have a significant impact on the GDP uh, with loss of close to 6% of GDP unless huge private sector investments are coming in. So we feel uh, that this sector is about to explode. Um, today, a lot of, you mentioned, uh, lakhs of crores of grant money uh, come in from very laudable schemes of Government of India, but it is extremely dependent on, um, on these grants uh, and supports uh, from the government. Uh, private capital uh, is yet to you know, get comfortable uh, 
uh, with the sector. Um, having said that, uh, I say it's an opportunity because there have been other sectors where some structural and policy related reforms uh, by government has enabled um, uh, lots of investment uh, in capacity like for example green energy um, happened and we've witnessed it all in the last uh, five, seven years. So I think water is poised uh, for a growth like that. It's also underbanked uh, because there is no debt, there's not enough debt and, and so Indusin Bank has taken a a little bit of, a, I would say, a punt here and uh, uh, looked at it as a strategic investment uh, where we would build a, a nice portfolio of companies. Uh, we actually work with multiple partners in the space today. Uh, USAID is a very strong uh, partner with us. Uh, together we have built a $50 million uh, facility where uh, both of us have committed that, you know, we will support um, good projects uh, in uh, wash sector. Um, apart from that, Indusind is also, you know, that's for the bigger, bigger kind of, bigger or at least modestly sized projects. For the smaller innovators, Indusind has, uh, is the banker of uh, choice in the wash innovation hub, which is created in Hyderabad. Uh, again, by Government of India promoted entity. It is close to 700 innovators. And the kind of problems and the help that they need there is entirely different. I must pull an entirely cap there because I'm sure they will have a lot of value to provide there. So, so we see ourselves in the banking sector as a little bit of pioneer here. And I'm very excited to be in this panel to discuss this. Thanks, thanks, Rupa. It's also great, but panelists are also moderators. So she's pulled in Shubra, and Shubra, you're like a, I see as a bridge, because financing coming in, you worked there recently, but then you worked with the people receiving the yes. financing, the entrepreneurs. Do, how do you see this landscape? How exciting or not? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anand. Uh, and hi, everyone, good afternoon. So um, I, I do, uh, so the answer to the question in terms of, you know, whether or not the landscape is moving forward and if we are seeing more positive uh, sort of waves of private sector participation, I, I would say it's yes and no. Because uh, like you mentioned and like Rupa also mentioned, there have been a uh, lot of initiatives, uh, you know, when it comes to the government talking about uh, private sector participation. So of course there's been significant expenditure outlay in uh, Swachh Bharat Mission, Jal Jeevan Mission, Amrut for, uh, for that matter. But they're also sort of uh, focusing on, let's say something like the Swachhita Startup Challenge, which sort of invited a lot of innovations in, uh, the waste management space, right? They're talking about within Amrut, there is a specific uh, technology submission to, to encourage innovations. Uh, there's, in fact, there's mandatory uh, requirement of uh, PPP projects being taken up uh, for million plus cities. Uh, you know, uh, at least 10% of the funds of a given city have to be spent on PPP projects. So in this way, uh, the government, of course, becomes a big buyer uh, for wash products and services. Uh, and, and which is what the enterprises also realize, right? They know that uh, if they have to scale in the country, they do need to work with the government. But, you know, basis in Telecap's experience of sort of talking to a lot of these entrepreneurs over the years, we figured that there are significant challenges, you know, right from day one, so pre-procurement, if I have to talk about, and let me uh, share a few examples. So in a, in a specialized sort of sector of, or rather segment of uh, WASH like FSM, there are various challenges that they face, uh, you know, in terms of being able to apply for tenders uh, for, you know, building uh, and operating these treatment plants, uh, which include uh, things like, you know, very high turnover requirements. So a lot of enterprises that are actually bidding for such projects because the, the cost ranges anywhere between, let's say, 30 to 40 lakhs to maybe one or two crores at max, right? So FSTPs are smaller plants. And it is the SMEs who are going to be bidding for such projects. But the turnover requirement, for example, is 25% of, of the project cost, which they may not be able to fulfill. Uh, the other things that are happening are, you know, specific, uh, let's say, geographic uh, uh, requirements in terms of them being, want, uh, them being registered in a certain state. However, we've spoken to a lot of private sector players who actually want to move to other states. They are, uh, you know, looking to scale across the country, but are not able to because of such, uh, you know, conditions. 
then of course there is the matter of uh, technology. So a lot of innovation is happening in the water treatment space, in the wastewater treatment space. And these organizations uh, would of course love to partner with the government provided they, they are really able to get their foot in the door, right? But what happens is we have the L1 system of tenders. We, uh, you know, most of these tenders are actually fixed technology tenders, wherein the government essentially says that, okay, look, this is the list of 10 technologies that we are okay with for a bidder to come in and participate with. And this is the solution uh, you should give us. Uh, alternatively, if they were able to, let's say, set the output requirements and keep the floor open for, uh, for these entrepreneurs to actually innovate with the method for, for the solution that they want to create, then that would be so much more helpful. So, you know, in that regard, and then there are, you know, other than procurement, of course, post-procurement also, payment delays, that's, I will not go into detail about that, that's one of the biggest issues, right? Uh, then, of course, there is, uh, you know, all the other land acquisition delays and, uh, you know, delays with regards to approvals, etc. So, this is the procurement piece of it. There are a couple other issues as well. When we're talking about, um, you know, there are now guidelines post-COVID with regards to on-site treatment of uh, wastewater for larger residential complexes, commercial complexes. However, the implementation of such guidelines will really help uh, the private sector to actually, you know, grow in this space. There are already guidelines, let's say, around hospitals actually treating their waste with specific uh, effluent treatment plants, but they continue to do it uh, in conventional STPs. So one is making regulations and guidelines, but the other part is, of course, about implementing them as well, right? The sure. third major issue that I see here is, you know, right now the, the narrative or, you know, what uh, we're focusing on is circularity. Uh, in terms of uh, reuse and recycle. We, if we need to ensure, especially with waste, right, if we need to ensure the journey from waste to wealth happens, we need to have standards for the byproducts that are created from waste, which is not there currently. So while I'd say that, yes, there are leaps and bounds of progress, you know, with the government starting to push in this direction, looking to, to bring in the private sector as well, but we do still have quite a long way to go. Incredible. So she's brought us right from the skies to the ground. So before we get any dismal manners, do you think she's left anything for you to cover? Or I think all the challenges are covered. You, When I look at you, I remember the FSTP lay plant and the success there. But you've worked with several entrepreneurs, Borda and Leap. How do you see this? No, sure. And yeah, Shubra, I think, covered a, a lot of things. Let me see if I can add a couple of points to that. Um, <clears throat> I think that, that there's definitely entrepreneurial energy that wants to solve these problems. Today, you know, even if you just break the wash, and of course, wash comprises so many different things, and the dynamics are very different in water versus wastewater versus toilets. Uh, rural urban, of course, again, is very, very different. But if you just break the customer segment into four groups, right? You look at businesses, you look at households in two segments, upper income and lower income households, and you take government. These are your four big buyers of sanitation solutions. Catering to businesses is relatively easier, although again, there are you know, terrible paymasters there also. But you have big companies in the private sector in WASH. You've got Warbag, you've got Thermax, you've got Iron Exchange, and these are multi-hundred crore businesses in the water sanitation space, right? Multi-thousand crores in some cases. So it's not like private sector is not involved in WASH or it is not possible to attract them and to build successful businesses. Problem becomes when you talk about low, low income households and government. This is where the problem is. We all have got toilets, our real estate developers spend thousands of crores every year on wash infrastructure for new constructions, right? So here you get into the payment issues, that's a big one. Now one of the solutions, for example, and you know, we've had conversations with various people, um, you know, with government, the expectation is that you will get paid. It's just that when and what your cost of getting paid is a little unpredictable, right? So what if there's a rule that 70% of the invoice value has to be released within two weeks of submission of invoice, automatically. There's no checking invoice, or, that, or you check your invoice within two weeks and say there's a problem with this. The remaining 30% you can fight over, you can exchange money, you can negotiate, all that stuff, right? But that keeps the working cycle going. And if you want private sector, you pay them on time, I think you increase your su supply of good companies that come forward. Uh, you know, in the lay experience, now this is a unique case, it doesn't apply to all PPPs. We went from the first visit and conversation with the municipality and the lay development authority to commissioning the plant in under four and a half months, okay? 
Now, why did that happen? Because the government authorities came to Borda and said, we want the solution, no matter what. A reasonable price. You structure it for us, recommend a party who will do it. And it moved very fast. Now, while we focus a lot on policy, we tend to not focus on who is going to implement the policy. And in India, believe me, policy does not matter as much as the person who wields the stick on how to execute that policy. So we need to also, the social sector, also focus on people who are making these decisions. And there is a whole political economy and corruption, right? I mean, that's, we all know that. But even within that, I think there are good officers who, with the right support, want to move faster and do things in a more transparent way. We need to find ways to enable them. There are no easy or quick, quick answers. Um, I think the aspect of you know, outcome-based projects is very important because that then leads to your hybrid annuity model kind of you know, PPP structures, but then you can't have small PPP. The one crore PPP just does not make sense to anybody, right? So then you've got to bundle it like what Andhra Pradesh did with FSM. But then one of the operators who got those contracts, they went to State Bank of India. State Bank of India would not finance a project that is underwritten by the government of Andhra Pradesh. And you're like, what's going on, right? I mean, uh, so how do you expect private lenders and private players to come in when the state bank is unwilling to finance a project that is issued and underwritten by the state government, right? So there's something obviously very, very deeply disconnected here. One last point I'll add on the financing side. We have equity, we have debt. If you look at structures globally, or at least in the more advanced financial markets, the gap is actually very blurred. Right? You can move from debt to equity and back depending on how business is going, how the environment is, more fluidly. Today we made this hard gap and therefore equity is not, you know, debt is not able to do, give the flexibility that equity provides. Equity is not able to get the returns and the exit that debt is able to get. And therefore we need to innovate on the financial products. And it's not one part is you know, the first loss guarantee kind of thing, but it's you know, prepayment thing, right? Or you know, co-payment kind of structures. I think we can ease up the working capital problem also. I think we can solve a lot of problems in the wash space. Wonderful. See what I mean about dream people? Yeah, they got it all covered here. So for example, you took us right down to a utopian situation where payments come in two weeks. People allow you to write your own contracts. Yeah. So that is wonderful, but then you brought us right back again saying there are things that are possible. Now, I'm going to use a trick from earlier in the day today, saying uh, audience flag up for questions in your mind. Start preparing the questions and know who you're asking to. Introduce yourself when you do so. But in order to give you a little more time and space, very focused questions to each one of you while uh, the audience gets ready to interact. One each and about as short an answer as you can manage to maximize time there. We'll go in the same order if you don't mind. So Rupa, banks, you're a bank. Banks, is the policy environment supportive? Are there any other policy reforms that you think Center, you already brought in center state ULB. Are there policy reforms at a particular level that you think will be more helpful? Yes, yeah, certainly, I think. Uh, I think um, so broadly, one can look at reforms around three areas. Uh, one is the whole, um, the whole uh, uh, division of responsibility has to become unified. Uh, when I say that uh, you have the uh, government of India, you have state level, uh, uh, municipal and uh, municipal municipalities and um, you will be who are executing the project so alignment of interest between these three players also uniformity of contracts and uh, uh, terms and conditions uh, incorporating some flexibility uh, on uh, uh, across states so this is missing uh, today uh, secondly what is missing is um, uh, you know, in the clean energy uh, area, I, I draw from that because that is scaled up uh, beautifully. Um, and and I, I spoke with NMCG, you know, the Namami Gangi project uh, was a fantastic experiment by Government of India in PPP projects. And um, the, the, the beauty there was that irrespective of where the project is, the money is from the central government. So you won't have a problem where State Bank of India is saying, I don't want to touch this particular project because the money is coming from government of India. Uh, like in clean energy, they created an entity which was an interim entity between, uh, between the multiple states because not all states are financially healthy in India. So you can't really blame banks because at the end of the day, even if the project is properly executed, the state may not have the money uh, uh, allocated to pay the uh, concessioner. So 
uh, having an entity in the middle uh, between government of India and all these states where the, uh, what in uh, clean energy, what SECI does is it pools the receivables from various state governments. They take the risk. If Andhra has delayed, they have the money coming in from Rajasthan. But the concessioner gets his money on time. So that risk of interstate delays and receivable uh, is taken by the government of India because it's their problem, right? Uh, it's not the private sector's problem. So that would be a huge... NMCG said that the government is planning to do this. Now the timing of that, I don't know when it will come out, but if it comes out, it will be a game changer uh, in uh, de-risking the receivables from government. The second uh, big thing is this about contracts, I said, and into the third thing is tariff flexibility around tariffs because today why private sector is not coming into these PPP projects is because per se the pro some of the projects are not profitable because of the low tariff because it's a political topic uh, water and financing water and how much will you ask the consumer to pay for it etc so governments are very touchy when they are awarding contracts and they're not giving the right tariff even to cover the cost as soon as the tariffs keep on going low, see, first of all, as you scale up, the tariff will automatically become lower because more people will come in and the demand supply uh, will start to adjust. But now scale is not there in the, uh, in the industry. Uh, and therefore, some flexibility on tariffs must be provided. And I think there is a clear case of that because at least in urban localities, if you see uh, the growth in bottled uh, water, and every, every Tom, Dick and Harry in uh, city space and has consumed bottled water, right? So there is enough money <laughs> to pay, I think. So these three, four changes will be a game changer. Sure, that's very interesting. These are, these are very good. I mean, though I'm not a great fan of people being able, but willingness to pay. There is great willingness to pay if there is a quality and there is a dignity of receiving that particular service, but Rupa, this is okay, extremely want, I, well I just wanted to add one more there. The transparency and stakeholder management in a sensitive topic like this, because when you are allowing people to play with tariffs, you must also uh, have the proper stakeholder management and transparency of data, because if the tariff is going up in the middle of the project, etc., managing public opinion around that. Yeah, yeah. No, our political... Uh, Leaders are very sensitive to tariffs, so you make sure that it'll be it'll be transparent. Um, he's given you a lovely idea about breaking up tariffs in the sense that industries' willingness to pay different from businesses to high-income groups. So we got that flexibility there. Um, Shubhra, I'm in mood for a tough question for you. There's availability of funding. There is requirement of funding, and there is there are challenges. There is. Some claim there's enough availability, some claim there is no funding in WASH. Who needs to innovate? I know it's not a, I mean, it's your ref, left hand and right hand, but <laughs> do the financiers need to innovate to lend or do the entrepreneurs need to innovate to receive finance? Or where does the balance stand? Okay, I, I will come to that. Uh, but let me sort of start uh, a little higher up first. So I think, um, and, and, and this is an estimated number, India to be able to achieve its uh, SDG 6 related targets by 2030 on an annual basis would need uh, anywhere around uh, $20 billion. Yeah? And from the key government programs itself, whether you're talking about uh, uh, SBM, JJM, or Amrut, uh, and, and an, again, an out, annual outlay number is, is a little over uh, $10, $10 billion. So there's a significant need as well as opportunity for the private capital to come in. That is one. Now, what happens is that a lot of this money goes towards the larger projects. So a centralized water treatment plant or a centralized wastewater treatment plant, you know, the larger STPs. Uh, the issue, and, and which is what uh, sort of Rupa was also talking about, right? NMCG, et cetera, projects. Of course, private sector will happily go there. Those are very large scale, large ticket size projects. But what I'm talking about is the small and medium enterprises. The other segments of WASH, when you're talking about decentralized water treatment, drinking water treatment, or public toilet construction and O&M, or for that matter, construction and O&M of FSTPs and the smaller decentralized STPs, right? They, their need is much smaller. 
And while there are some private pools of capital looking at India, uh, you know, looking at uh, WASH, but the ticket sizes are pretty much upwards of $250,000, which is not the need of these enterprises. Yeah? And uh, like I was mentioning before, uh, IntelliCap as such has worked with a lot of entrepreneurs to understand what their business model is for each of these business models, what are the kind of uh, financing needs they have, you know, project level cash flows to really see uh, what could be those credit product needs that, uh, that would really help them, right? That is one. Now, uh, and, and these smaller players are not able to go to banks because of uh, lack of collateral. They are not able to go to NBFCs because of the high interest rates, which is where there is a, you know, a big white space, so to say, to, you know, to address, to help them access finance, and which is where uh, uh, IntelliCap has now uh, sort of, uh, is putting together a debt facility for uh, WASH enterprises in India. This is, in fact, the first uh, debt facility focused on water and sanitation enterprises in India. And what we've tried to do is, is innovate, right? So the answer to your question, that who needs to innovate, I think it's, the, uh, it's now the turn of financiers to innovate. We've seen uh, enterprises doing that. We've seen them uh, you know, really uh, sort of working through with uh, technological innovations to try to enable access to water, to try to enable uh, sort of access to safely managed sanitation for the country. But, uh, but I think the time now is for financiers to innovate. And what I mean here is, is two, three things, right? One, of course, we need to see, so WASH projects, uh, we are working with the government. Your, of course, uh, there are significant payment delays. Uh, there's also, um, you know, to, to that extent, uh, the products that a financier designs needs to be structured, to Manas's point, right? We, we absolutely have to have long-term structured products because more and more ULBs are also uh, wanting longer-term uh, uh, sort of projects, right? So even private sector initially used to, EPC players would want to, let's say, uh, just come in, construct a treatment plant, move out. But what they need now is they're actually building in multi-year operations and maintenance within that. So the projects are becoming more long term, which is where the financing also needs to sort of uh, work hand in hand with that. That is one part. The, the second part is uh, capacity building, right? Beyond the, um, you know, the, the standard business expansion services in terms of business planning, or let's say helping them uh, build partnerships, uh, or just sort of to help them scale, I think we also need to support them, we need to go a little further to support them. So if I'm talking about, uh, let's say the India Wash Fund, it's an AIF. Now an AIF can actually uh, subscribe to instruments such as NCDs, non-convertible debentures. That is not something that uh, such uh, enterprises would have looked at before. So we, we need to include that component of helping them in issuing such instruments. So that kind of support will also be needed. If we are going to innovate with products, we will also need to ensure that the enterprise which is receiving that is uh, able to do, uh, is, is actually able to take it, right? Uh, third, of course, uh, beyond the, let's say, the, the product structuring and the capacity building piece, I believe we also need to look at, you know, the larger sort of ecosystem of support. Which, which of course there is a lot, lot happening right now on that as well. But the whole contracts piece, we we have been working with uh, you know different state governments as part of the NFSSM alliance. We sort of been trying to build model contracts, but the whole procurement piece is a big, big issue. So many of the entrepreneurs that we are looking at right now, um, in terms of you know even uh, as the pipeline for the Wash Fund, uh, are doing amazing innovations, but their biggest problem is uh, is procurement. For the gov because the government is the biggest off taker, for uh, them to be able to scale in the country, they have to sort of uh, look at that as a prospective uh, client. And for that, they, they need uh, to be able to work uh, in an environment where, you know, that contract risk is managed. They There's a fairly balanced uh, uh, sort of contract risk in that sense between the public and private entity. I'll <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Shubhra is available with us for the evening, for those of you who wish her to continue. But right now, just in the interest of time, the, the crosses that a moderator bears. 
So Manas, you are relieved because financiers have to innovate, is what I heard Absolutely. from her. But uh, are entrepreneurs, there are investors right here, are entrepreneurs capitalizing? Are they able to enter the space and attract financing? What's your experience? Well, they're able to enter this. Look, there's no doubt that there is a lot we would want, lot more we would want from entrepreneurs too, both in terms of the number of entrepreneurs and their understanding of the business and how they win that business, right? Uh, today, very honestly, there's very little real support. While you have an explosion of these accelerators and incubators, most of them are really not adding value to the kind of businesses who can realistically get government contracts. Because, you know, day zero, you're not ready for the government. So saying an incubator for nine months is as good as not doing anything as far as this is concerned. What we need, and therefore at Leap Cities, when we set it up, we said, let's create five-year programs for supporting companies that have gone past proof of concept and are ready to scale up. You know? So going from like that four, five crore revenue to a 50, 100 crore revenue, right? Today, there's zero per number of people providing that kind of support in an intense, comprehensive manner to wash businesses. So I'd love to see more people step in and say, how do we identify these businesses and make them larger and, and uh, winners? Uh, I think uh, it, it's, you know, financials definitely need to innovate. I'll just bring the question back to one, maybe a slightly bigger level issue, which is you know, relevant to both financiers and ecosystem builders, right? See, wash solutions cannot exist in a standalone va vacuum. You know, when you just go out and build toilets today, then say next year we will build water supply, then we will think about the next piece, you end up with a bunch of disjointed stuff that doesn't work together and eventually crumbles and doesn't perform because there's no planning and thought around the whole system. See, wash is nothing, we don't need innovation for wash, right? The whole world has solved this problem over the last 20 to 200 years, right? So we have to look at ourselves and say, what is not working? I think one is at the institutional level, the responsibility has to be pushed down to a city level. And it is not. It sits at a state level, at a national level. At a city level, you need a group of people who take accountability. So the idea of utilities, which has been so, you know, it's been widely talked about, but so resisted by the political structure often. But how do you have utilities which manage water infrastructure, sanitation services long term? There's no rocket science to it, but it needs to be done. Um, and then looking at what sort of technologies are we building, right? Today, it's still too much cement, too much reliance on materials that are just not good for our environment. Uh, we need to look at more nature-based solutions, more localized solutions, which again, your top-down approach ties to say, let's do 100 in one year, uh, and then you have to replicate it without any thought, right? So better solutions, I think innovations are there. Uh, contract structures, how do they bring it down? Financiers, understanding that, building flexibility across debt and equity and then enabling the enterprises to really go in there and solve problems and expand slowly, but in a right way, I think, I think it's very doable, but I think it requires a lot of more conversations like this. Fantastic, Amanas. You know, part of me is an academician and it's incredible how in India I've always found that compared to the West where academics is at the forefront of, of technology or of knowledge, in India it's always the industry. I mean, I can't believe these guys aren't professors or something, you know, but they've, they've, I think they've, they've reached a certain stage in the, uh, at least in WASH financing, where they seem to be covering the entire spectrum. Over to you, uh, the speakers are yours for any particular questions. Show of hands and a mic. Lunch wasn't all that good though. Post tea break, my session next time, yeah? <laughs> the gentleman there, please. Do introduce yourself and the person you're addressing the question to. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Tenzin Thakwo and I represent an NGO. Uh, I'm from the Tibetan community, a refugee one who is settled in India, born and brought up. So I just, you know, like, uh, uh, want to say something about the water conservation, the wash one. And uh, the last six years, I've been spearheading this water conservation project in my community. And uh, somehow I felt that the uh, government, uh, they just say that in their uh, website, they say they support NGOs. But when I practically went there and seek data, they were like very hesitant. And they say like, I need permission from that department. I need to you know, like send a mail to home department. So it's very you know, like disheartening. But you know, I felt somehow that you know, if you go with your own dedication and doing your own research by doing, you know, going to Taluka each camp, like data collector, data analyzer, and if you shape creator, then the government will recognize you as well. And somehow, but still, you know, it feels that the government is not, you know, what she's taking those initiatives, which they are supposed to do to, you know, what you say, uh, make sure to, you know, let's like say, uh, take steps to mitigate the threats the community faces. So I think, you know, the like government and NGO, 
they still have some conflict of interest. And uh, for that, you know, if you have any suggestions or guidance, I would be very happy to have. Sure. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. I'm going to throw it to Manas, though he didn't specify. So this is perfect for an ease of doing business uh, session, actually, because in, in, in the urban one where I worked on, we had just one indicator called construction permits. And the central ministry, it was so focused on achieving the, uh, the ranking, they set up task forces so that nobody could blame each other. And the time for the, the user was the least. So if you wanted something, it, they had to set their act together. And uh, according to your dream, a permit is deemed given if it exceeds the time that it spends at a table. So that's how we achieved the ranking. But Manas, uh, water conservation, genuine effort having to go from table to table? Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a huge issue, right? And it depends a lot on where you are and what the exact problems are. But I think it comes back, if I just tie it into the conversation we had, it comes down to, you know, that there are certain things that the government says, we will do this. But there are a lot of needs of people that fall outside those boxes. And then you don't know where to go to, right? Uh, with CSR and with philanthropy, that has its own challenges. For every rupee that is out there, there is a hundred rupees of demand. Uh, so where do you go? And then it ends up being relationships or your proximity. So cities will sometimes get lots or rural areas will get some, but you know, it's, not, it's not uniformly distributed. I mean, look, at some point, I feel that like what is the role of community and people, right? We keep saying government must do this, this one must provide that. And I feel that you know, some of these things also come down to, you know, when I look at rural water, for example, and I don't want to be, you know, I'm going to make a very generalized statement and people can pick a lot of holes in what I'm going to say. But the fact is the way we live, what we choose to grow, what we choose to consume is what creates the water problems. It is not some God sent climate problem, right? Like we are abusing, you know, water, I say, I say water is the biggest single use resource. That you never use water more than once. Plastic, you still reuse it, right? What are we doing about that? Today, my electricity bill at home ranges from 7,000 to 15,000 rupees a month, depending on the time of the year. Is any household in India paying that much in water bills? We are not, right? Going back to the, the issue. So I think there's, not, it doesn't directly address your this thing, but I think water needs to become a local issue. And we have seen cases in Rajasthan and Gujarat and other places where communities take it up. It's not easy, it is not cheap, and people also in India don't always get along very well to solve problems in a collective manner, right? Uh, I don't know the exact context, so I don't have any, obviously no solutions, it's a, it's a big issue, but I think there are a lot of fundamental issues we need to resolve. If we really want to make water something that once again we can all enjoy, decent quality water at a reasonable price without all this scarcity and private capture and trading and prices going up and down. I think there's a lot of work we need to do as a society. It's not just the government and businesses that can solve it either. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Manas. I'm waiting for a show of hands. There, gentlemen at the, at the rear. You got a mic with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah lovely. Yeah. Hi. Hi, thanks uh, for the great discussion. So my name is Sunil Bhatt. Uh, so I work for Microsoft Consulting. Uh, we are a financial inclusion consulting firm uh, working largely in Asia as well as Africa. Uh, so Shubra uh, 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 kind of pointed a few things on how financiers have to kind of innovate, right? So, 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 so just was curious to understand if there are some good global examples uh, uh, of, of countries which have done this. Right, and, and also for, uh, uh, even Manas also mentioned of equity and uh, debt financing as well. So just wanted to see if there are some countries uh, which can be uh, a sort of guiding light for uh, developing nations uh, and also for countries like India. So in, any examples which come to your mind? All right, thanks. Um, I think in terms of examples, uh, so to be honest, uh, you know, when we were trying to set up, uh, uh, when we sort of started our journey for the India Wash Fund, that's the first thing we, we started to do, right? To, to see uh, if there are any good examples of uh, what, uh, you know, in terms of supporting uh, water and sanitation enterprises and, and how this can be done innovatively beyond the, uh, you know, the standard sort of financial ecosystems that each country has. And to be very honest, uh, WASH as such has, does, has very few examples like that. There have been um, uh, sort of, uh, and even within WASH, you know, you would see sort of, uh, I'd say, let me use the word discrimination here. Uh, you'd see much more uh, financing towards water rather than uh, uh, sort of sanitation for that matter, right? 
uh, but but yes, there there has been multiple uh, sort of efforts that have uh, uh, taken place, and you know, and this I, I can sort of recall from, uh, let's say, let me come from a funder perspective here. Uh, there's uh, an entity called Aqua for All, right? Uh, they're a Netherlands-based entity, and they their focus is actually to take uh, uh, sort of provide the risk capital. So they would provide first loss capital, they would provide uh, sort of capital, particularly for uh, capacity building of enterprises, right? There's, uh, they're also sort of right now working on an impact link fund uh, for WASH. So, so there are some of these uh, examples. There are a lot of um, some examples where let's say sort of corporates come in to, to become outcome payers, right? While uh, there is, uh, so that, of course, you know, the, the outcome pair angle is one. The other is whenever you're talking about the, the mismatch between what an entrepreneur can pay versus what the lender needs, there are a lot of uh, uh, sort of structures where interest subvention comes in, and particularly for that piece of the puzzle, an investor comes in, right? So I think there are, there are of course, many efforts happening, but uh, it's, it's still... You know, it's, it's a piecemeal thing, right? That because they're focusing on, let's say, a particular region or a particular segment for that matter. In WASH, like I said, the larger focus is on water. Even for the funds that call themselves, or facilities that call themselves as WASH facilities, even there you will see that majority sort of goes towards water. And also majority may go towards larger ticket sizes, not smaller ones. So which is where I was coming from earlier, that for the smaller ticket sizes, the needs that you see for SMEs, that's that's where we really need to innovate now, and that's the journey we are taking. Shall I shall I add? Please quickly to his question. Yeah, sure. Just I just wanted to point out there are some very interesting. Um, she was right. The bigger ones are focused on water, and they are between governments. Uh, so they are very interesting blue bonds and ocean bonds that have been done globally, especially in Caribbean islands and so on and so forth. Where they, uh, you know, India can also replicate that, say in Sundarbans, for example, uh, where, you know, you can preserve the ecosystem by issuing a bond. Wonderful. I'm afraid that's all we have time for because uh, Bhavani will turn into Durga and kind of slay me if I continue this session any longer. But. Uh, a round of applause, guys, for our uh, panelists here.